So we had a 10-day conference. It started at 9 a.m. in the morning each day, and it's gone until 10 p.m. at night. Each, con each lecture was 90 minutes. And a lot of people said a lot of things. But the thing about the conference is that in some ways we didn't need it because none of the authors presented a book that just came out this week. Every author wrote their book already. The information's been out. So you could have read the book. Anyone could have read the book. So we didn't have this conference because we were bringing you, you know, the latest information that just came out last week. We had this conference because there's information that came out that doesn't seem to be getting a response from a large por portions of our society. So some of the books that these authors wrote were written 5, 10, 15 years ago, but somehow there wasn't a response always, or there wasn't an outrage. So we had this conference to say, wait a minute, did, did you see what was in that book? Did, did you hear what they said? And we were hoping that some would say, whoa, I, somehow that got missed. Let's talk about that again. So the topic of this, of this panel is actually the topic we've talked about a lot. It's been discussed. And it's been mentioned to you many times. But the reality is there's still, it's not resolved. In other words, if you call the fire department because there's a fire five times and no one comes, you got to call the fire department again. You don't just ignore it. Somehow, despite the books, despite the lectures, despite the videos, despite all the people telling you about a lot of this information, somehow large portions of society are completely, completely ignoring this information. Not even considering it, and not just everyone, the, the highest level journalism, the magazines, newspapers, supposedly the, the, the top newspapers in the country often completely ignore it. So nothing has changed. The building is, if the building is burning and no one is responding, you, you need to call again, even though you called five times. So we are here to talk about an issue that's not a side issue, it's not a little issue, it's not a subtle issue, it's not an issue that we should deal with in 20 years. It's an absolute burning issue that somehow people are conveniently putting to the left, to the right, out of their mind. Helen Caldicott speaks about nuclear power. She was here the other day, and in the middle of her talk, she said, listen, everyone stop. You're doing psychic numbing. You're not listening. Do you understand the consequences of how serious this is? And she forced everyone to focus. Well, this panel is to try to say, hold on. No matter how much you think you've heard it, no matter how much we've talked about it, no matter, you know, no matter what is going on, somehow this information is still on the peripheral. It's still not registering where people are talking about this every day on talk radio, in the newspapers, in politics. The presidential elections are coming up in 2016. Is this even going to be mentioned? So I'm going to ask some questions, and I hope that we could just really directly make sure that somehow, if you see that, think this is meaningful, you'll send this video to people, and they'll send it to people, and make sure people hear this information. And if they choose to ignore it, that is their right. But let's make sure everyone understands what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to start with some questions. I guess before I start, why don't each of you just give a maybe a quick hello and just um, maybe your just quick thoughts on my opening comments before we go into the specifics. If that would be OK. okay. Um, am I on here? You can hear me? There it is. That's what I thought. OK. Uh, so I'm Hope Bohannik. Um, thank you all so much for being here and everyone that's watching on the web as well. Uh, and you know, the, he's right, this isn't a side issue. A lot of people um, feel, you know, when they're looking at dietary choices, that health is their number one concern or ethics for the animals. Um, the environment kind of gets to be a, a, a 
an afterthought or a, a, and that's great too, it's good for the environment. Uh, but this is, we're in a crisis with the planet and I think that it's really wonderful that, that we've dedicated an entire panel to this uh, aspect of um, our food industry. Uh, it's, it's critical, it's affecting so much, and we're gonna get into all that, excessive water use and water pollution, air pollution, soil degradation, uh, loss of biodiversity, climate change, all of that is uh, in involved um, and critically uh, impacted through animal agriculture, and I'm, we're gonna get more into that. So anyway, I just, I appreciate that we're bringing this to the forefront and uh, making this uh, a, a critical issue because it is. Uh, yeah, my name is Will Tuttle, and um, I, I'm, I really like the uh, analogy you used if you have to just keep calling the fire department again because it's still burning. And I think, you know, one point that's important to uh, raise here is that uh, I think there's two forces at work that are keeping the message from really being heard and discussed and talked about and spread and shared and so forth. One of the uh, main factors is that uh, the moneyed power interests in our society do not want this information or this understanding or this awareness to um, get out to people too much because there's just so much money to be made from sick people, <laughs> for number one. And there's a lot of money to be made from uh, business as usual, the way it's going. Uh, however, that's not in our best interest at all. And the other factor uh, is that the people, most of, most of the people in our society uh, are eating foods that they would, re eating the very foods that are responsible for the uh, devastation. And they also, in many ways, are uncomfortable with this uh, information. It's kind of the inconvenient truth. Even Al Gore didn't want to talk about it. It was so inconvenient. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, we, we, that's kind of, the, I think, the underlying dynamic. But again, it's wonderful to see that there's a lot of positive change happening uh, as we run up against the walls of um, the obvious uh, implications of animal agriculture. Uh, and I'm Dave Simon, and my mic is on. And uh, I guess I don't have much to add because uh, Steve, Hope, and Will have really um, hit the nail on the head. We have a major problem, and, and major environmental organizations so far have not paid much attention to it. And in fact, Al Gore just had a conference several days ago which he served meat, and he just doesn't get it. So um, we'll, talk, we'll talk today about what those effects are. Okay. So. What I'd like to do is try as specifically as we can to try to actually name what it is we're talking about, what's going to happen. So I'd like to try to make sure that we hit all the different things that are happening. So let's assume, um, I don't know where you want to start, but I'd like to try to make sure we name, and we've got time, so I'd like to name each of the things that we are saying happen when someone chooses to eat meat versus someone who is eating sprouts and using very little resources. So I guess, you know, you could start, um, you could start anywhere, but let's try to name all the different things so that it really is clear. And again, everyone has a choice what they want to do. No one has to listen to this information, but I would like to at least be clearly naming each of the things. So maybe if you could each, um, each answer this and maybe just, you don't have to answer all the things at once, but let's start somewhere. What is, cl what, let's clearly define what, what, what things would be affected. We'll start with a few of them and there will one of them and we'll add to it from there. Um, well, the, the list that I had was, uh, you know, like I just said, we've got climate change, water resource wasting, water pollution, air, uh, air pollution, um, soil degradation and biodiversity loss, species loss, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's so much, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and s jump in here. And um, I think one of the things that we hear quite a bit about lately is climate change. And uh, again, what's um, been neglected uh, very obviously is any discussion of animal agriculture. We're told 
that we should change our light bulbs and buy a Prius or something. But actually, uh, the research that's been done, not only Livestock's Long Shadow, which was a, a um, United Nations uh, study that, sh that kind of shocked everybody, saying that animal agriculture is responsible for 18% of all the greenhouse gases that humans are creating more than all the transportation. And then later, uh, Robert Goodland and, uh, Goodland and Ang Hang from the World Bank did a study for the, uh, for the World Bank, and they said that's way too conservative, it should be more like 51%. And um, so th these are shocking statistics if they're true, and I think there's a lot of indications. Some people, some researchers say that maybe even 51% is conservative when you consider the devastating impacts of animal agriculture, that so much grain has to be grown, uh, that these animals are emitting uh, enormous amounts of methane, which is considered to be about 70 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide also, which is maybe 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and, uh, and cutting down rainforests, which really are the lungs of the earth, and uh, destroying, uh, overfishing the oceans, really causing uh, devastation to uh, coral reefs and the, the uh, oceans are also another of the uh, lungs of the planet too that are being destroyed by, by nu uh, nutrient rich runoff that's um, causing dead zones and so forth. So we see animal agriculture compounds the problems uh, in so many ways and, cl and climate change I think should be one that we're really aware of. Al Gore bless his heart, you know, he did go vegan, even though he did it very quietly, finally. But um, uh, the, the whole idea that, that we're just simply ignoring uh, the role of animal agriculture in eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, and dairy uh, is really serious. I mean, dairy, lamb, uh, all of these um, foods. And to me, um, I'll just close by saying, I think it's enormously disempowering, you know, to people to, to have this uh, message constantly coming from the, from the mass media that we have this problem that's really serious and it could mean the end of life on our planet and all you can do is change a light bulb, you know? <laughs> and and uh, people think they're really doing something and keep eating meat and dairy and the problems, you know, uh, get more severe. I don't know if you've done any research lately, but the Arctic uh, and the Antarctic are melting at rates. There's feedback loops, you know, that are kicking in, uh, and these feedback loops are really serious because the more uh, the, the warmer it gets up in the Arctic and the Antarctic, the more the ice melts, and that's called the albedo effect. So there's less white, uh, you know, covering the the water, and so the water is dark, so it's absorbing even more heat, which makes it warm up even more, and there are massive methane deposits that have been frozen for millions of years and they're starting to thaw. People say when you take a boat up there, uh, you know, just, just a few years ago, there were, it was just like normal water, but now there's, it's like fizz, fizzing. It's just fizzing with methane bubbles pouring out um, millions and millions of gallons of methane. And this is very powerful greenhouse gas. So we're already, some scientists say we may have already gone too far. You know, we don't know, but it's really an emergency situation in the sense that these are, these are positive feedback loops that we have started by the, what we've done already. So we should really be getting the message out that it's important for us to um, reduce the amount of meat and dairy we're consuming so that uh, the, the environment can heal, the climate uh, can be restabilized re again. Well, if, if I could, oh. I just, I, I thought we were being very broad, but I guess we're getting in specific about climate change. So um, I, I can just say a few things about that. Um, so, you know, interestingly, uh, what do you think the, the Pentagon, the World Bank, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Greenpeace all have in common? The Pentagon and Greenpeace have something in common. They actually do. They all believe that greenhouse gases are that climate change is real uh, and that humans are causing uh, the issue, the greenhouse gases, and that animal agriculture is contributing significantly to greenhouse gases. So the Pentagon, the World Bank, uh, they've all put out these kinds of studies as well as Greenpeace. So, you know, this is, this is uh, across the board information that is out there that we know is factual. Uh, and like uh, Will was saying, um, you know, there, there's numerous greenhouse gas emission, uh, different greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide that we often hear about from uh, car exhaust. 
but there's nitrous oxide and methane and other emissions, and uh, we're seeing in animal agriculture, 65% of our human-caused nitrous oxide is coming from animal agriculture, 37% uh, of the methane. Um, there's excessive energy and fossil fuel use in the processing uh, of animals. Um, more than 400 other polluting gases are coming from animal agriculture, hydrogen sul uh, sulfide, carbon dioxide. Uh, there's energy, massive energy consumption and the destruction of the rainforest, of course, cutting down the rainforest. The primary reason for that we're cutting the rainforest is for cattle grazing and raising the grain that's going to feed that cattle. Uh, so that, of course, is, you know, we're losing our, our carbon sequestering from uh, the, the green of the rainforest. So there's just really massive amounts of energy wasted in industrial farming, the, the slaughterhouse, the processing. Um, uh, these are indoor environments with conveyor belts, milking machines, lighting, heating. It's just an energy drain compared to vegetable farming, which, you know, you've got the, the farm uh, growing the grains and they're going to, uh, you know, the farmer's market are going to the processing plant. But there's so many more steps involved in animal agriculture, the grain brought to the animals, animals to auction, animals to slaughter, carcass to processing, product to market. I mean, there's just so much more going on that, cre that you know, really uh, uses the resources in uh, a 2009 report from the UN, and you know, if you if, if you follow these studies that the UN is putting out, that the UN has numerous subsidiary you know subsidiary groups like the Food and Agriculture Organization, and like this one, the International Panel on Sustainable Resource Management, all kinds of different ones. They they put out these studies maybe. I mean, it seems like once a month. I mean, you see, there's so many of them uh, that talk about the all these issues that we're talking about: water and air pollution, stuff like that. But this one, uh, it, it strongly urged a global shift to a plant-based diet to both feed the world and greatly reduce environmental impacts like global warming. Um, it takes eight times as much fossil fuel to produce animal food as to produce plant food. And even the least efficient plant food is nearly 10 times as energy efficient as the most efficient animal food. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're at the market and you're thinking, oh, I want to eat as environmentally, you know, sustainable as possible, you may look at a, a, a local organic dairy product and think, oh, it's, you know, it's local, it's organic, and, and we can get more into to those labels later, but, and you may think that's, you know, that's got to be better than maybe this tomato that came from Mexico, you know, because it came from so far away. Well, that's not necessarily the case because animal foods are so heavy on production. Uh, it takes so much more fossil fuels, so much more energy. Uh, so, you know, it's very possible that that tomato with a tropical tan is actually the more <laughs> ecological food. So, you know, it, it's not cut and dry, but um, definitely, um, animal foods are so much more heavy on production. I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, there was a study in the University of Chicago that found that consuming no animal products is 50% 50 50 more effective at fighting global warming than switching from a standard car to a hybrid. So our food is really, really, really impactful. That's where we need to be looking to reduce our impact. So, Dave? You have yeah, um, the other perspective that I would add on the climate change issue is that if there were only a few thousand humans on the planet, it wouldn't really matter what we ate or how we produced it. But there are 7 billion people on the planet. They're expected to be 11 billion people by 2050. In this country, we have doubled our meat consumption since about 1935, we've gone from about 100 pounds per person per year to just under 200 pounds per person per year. And worldwide, the trend is the same. People in every country are increasing their meat consumption. There's been a slight dip here in the past couple of years in consumption. There is cause for optimism over that. However, I think that might just be related to price because prices have gone up in connection with drought conditions and, and Western states that have caused feed crop prices to rise. So I think that what might happen when prices stabilize is we'll see consumption continue to go up. Nevertheless, if, if we could dial back our consumption levels to a reasonable level, say where we were in 1950, which would be about a 44 to 45 percent reduction, that would have the same effect 
on greenhouse gas emissions in this country as garaging all of our motor vehicles and motor vessels. That would be huge. And all we would have to do is go back to the level of meat that we were eating in 1950. And by the way, in 1950 in this country, one in eight people was obese. Today that figure is one in three. And also, um, one thing to be aware of in terms of global warming, because in all of this, we, um, we don't hear too much about fishing, but uh, fishing today uh, is also uh, contributing quite a bit just because all, there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole armies of, of large-scale ships out on the oceans that use huge amounts of diesel fuel to bring the fish back, and they stay out for long periods of time now because the, the fish are basically gone. They've been completely you know, destroyed, the, the, the close fisheries. Um, so they have to go way out into the deep waters of the oceans. And uh, so fish is something that's also actually contributing to, to greenhouse gases just because it takes so much diesel fuel to run these operations. And I think uh, Hope touched on this point, but I want to underline it, how we don't usually see, uh, it's not so obvious, like when you put your, your gas, uh, uh, you know, go to a gas station, you put the, the nozzle into your tank, you can see the petroleum going in there, you know. But you don't see when you go to a, buy a hamburger that you actually just put in, you know, maybe 20 gallons of fuel. <laughs> you, don't see, you don't see it pouring in. Uh, it's enormous amount, uh, amounts of uh, fossil fuels are required for animal foods because there's so many inputs along the way. Natural gas, it takes just enormous amounts of natural gas to create the fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer, and then petroleum to create all the pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides which are used. Those are, those are, those are um, oil-based. So you have natural gas and oil, and then to run the machinery, to irrigate, to run all the machines, to uh, grow all this grain, to feed it to the animals, to truck it around. Uh, we lived in an RV, like I said, for 17 years traveling, and you can, when you get out there and really see how much uh, these gigantic um, uh, places where animals are con you know have forced to congregate feedlots and massive uh, mountains of hay and massive mountains of manure and it's enormous the amount of petroleum that's actually involved here and it's easy to pretend or, or to think that it's that, that it's not that much the same with water as well and it's quite shocking I think a lot of times people hear this and they go oh, that, that just couldn't be true that, that it takes you know so much more petroleum to uh, create say uh, a, um, a burger than a veggie burger, but we're talking about it really does, and uh, that's what we need to uh, address, that we can make enormous changes. And it's good to see, actually, that we have companies like Beyond uh, Meat and other companies that are creating uh, plant-based alternatives. One more quick thing, if I could, about the fishing that's very interesting, uh, a climate change connection with fishing that's new. This new research is coming out that, that is showing that because we have overfished the ocean so incredibly, um, you know, when, when we had a natural amount of fish in the oceans, the fish waste actually absorbs carbon into the ocean. But now that we have overfished the ocean so terribly and there's so few fish, so, many, so much fewer fish, fish in the ocean, we're actually hastening global warming by not having that natural carbon sequestering in the ocean of the, the fish waste. So it's, it's just amazing how much impact we've had on this planet and just how interconnected everything is. Uh, but that's just another you know, piece of the puzzle that's just fascinating, that the overfishing is actually hastening global warming because of the, the lack of uh, fish waste in the ocean.